Hands up if anyone in the audience has a mobile phone. Quite a lot. Okay. Well, when I was your age, the most sophisticated piece of technology we had was a black and white television. Mobile phones hadn't been invented. Uh, pocket calculators were about this big. You said you couldn't fit them in your pocket. Oh, well, I should introduce my mum. Um, and the thing that captivated my generation um, was the Apollo missions and the journey to the moon. And it's like, at this stage, we didn't have a television set in my house, so we're next door, gathered around the television, watching the launch of the Saturn V rocket um, and the start of the venture towards the moon landing. At that time, we also had some pretty inspiring politicians, not so sure we have those anymore, who set the goal of that. And sure enough, at the end of the 1960s, whoops, dropped a slide there. At the end of the 1960s, the moon landing happened. I am on the moon. Now, I'd like to uh, make sure you're all paying attention and you're not sending texts on your mobile phone. So, there's a few questions through this um, little talk. And the first question is who was the second man to set foot on the moon? Does anyone know the answer? I have to incentivize here. There's a cash prize for the person who gets the answer right first. At the back there? Is it Buzz Aldrin? It was Buzz Aldrin. You get to claim the first cash prize. <laughs> now, I've been, now, I've now I've definitely caught your attention because there's two more questions during the course of this talk. <laughs> so pay attention, you might get some clues as to the answer. First prize of the day. It was Buzz Aldrin. And here he is standing on the moon. And here's the view from the moon back to the Earth. And of course, the first thing you notice about this view is that the Earth is a blue planet, a planet predominantly covered in ocean. It really should be called planet ocean rather than planet Earth. Meanwhile, back on the Earth, and prior to the moon landings, one Swiss inventor decided he'd like to take a different voyage, a voyage to the deepest point in the ocean. And he built this machine here, a Bacchus gave called the Trieste, with the objective of taking two people to the bottom of the deepest point in the world's ocean. And you can see um, the Trieste being prepared for its first test dive here. So this is basically an underwater balloon, a big tank full of paraffin to give it buoyancy, and suspended underneath it, a steel sphere in which you could just about fit two people. You had to have some sense of adventure to take the voyage in this to the bottom of the ocean. But two people did. Um, the inventor's son, so August Picard's son, um, and then young um, US Navy captain. In, and they went to the bottom of the deepest point in the world's ocean in this vehicle in the early 1960s. So here's where the deepest point in the world's ocean is. It's in the Pacific. And it's the Challenger Deep. And these two individuals are the only two people who've ever been to the bottom of the Challenger Deep. The only thing that's been there since 
um, is several robotic vehicles, which we'll hear more about later. And I'm going to return to this issue of the, getting to the bottom of the challenge of deep at the end of this presentation. So, the second question, and I'll take the answer that the nearest, to the nearest thousand metres. How deep is the challenge of deep? Anyone else? Back there? 11,000 metres. 11,000 metres it is. <laughs> you get to claim the second prize. And the way that we're working in the ocean now, we're working at depths where it's beyond the reach of divers, so we have to use robots on the sea floor. And what you can see here is the launch of an underwater vehicle, a remotely operated vehicle. Again, you'll hear more about those later today. Um, which is being lowered to the seafloor and which will then be used to undergo, to, to carry out maintenance tasks on the seabed. And this is a vehicle controlled from the surface, so it's like playing a computer game, driving the joysticks, so piloted by pilots on the surface who are controlling all the, the activities of this undersea robot. Here's another underwater vehicle. This time again, a manned mini submarine, a rather famous one called Alvin, uh, which is operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in the United States. Alvin's been around for some time. It's just been rebuilt and relaunched, a new version of Alvin, um, capable of working not to the depths of the Challenger Deep, but certainly down into the deep ocean. And Alvin's been responsible for some very well known discoveries. It was Alvin that helped in the discovery of the wreck of the Titanic. So what we see here is um, <coughs> imagery taken with a robot vehicle tethered to Alvin of the Titanic on the seafloor. the robot vehicle here which is tethered to the submarine and being controlled from the submarine which is moving around the wreck um, taking photographs and we made another very very important discovery and that was the discovery of these features in the deep ocean these are things called hydrothermal vents 
where seawater is circulating through the ocean bed and is coming back to the surface as very, very hot pools of water. And they are exiting from the seabed to form these columns of what look like, looks like black smoke. And the astounding thing with this discovery was that all around these hydrothermal vents, these vents of hot water escaping from the ocean floor, we find all these biological communities. So huge communities of animals at a depth well beyond where sunlight can penetrate. So these are communities that are living on the minerals that are coming out in this superheated water. So an amazing discovery made quite recently and a huge amount of research being done on understanding how these communities work and understanding this hydrothermal circulation of water through the, through the ocean floor crust. Now we take us back into space um, and one of the areas I work in which is making observations of the oceans from space. And what we see here is the launch of an Earth observation satellite on the European Space Agency Ariane launcher. Going back into space, we've been able to observe the planet from much further away than we, uh, we did from the Moon. Um, this is a picture of the Earth taken from Mars. And again, you can see the blue planet. Here's another picture of Earth taken from the Cassini spacecraft in 2006. That tiny blue dot is the Earth from 800 million miles away. Again, you can see a blue dot. My interest, though, is closer to home and that's actually making observations of the oceans from space. So we have a whole array of satellites now in polar orbits around the planet observing the oceans and making all sorts of measurements of ocean temperature, ocean salinity, um, surface waves, of tides, of currents, <coughs> making those observations from space borne instruments. Also making observations inside the oceans to understand their structure. What we see here is an instrument being dropped from an aircraft. So another very fancy piece of technology, small parachute, the instrument hits the sea surface, the parachutes detach, and a little robotic machine <coughs> drops from the ocean surface down to the depths. <clears throat> so there's an animation of one of these floats. These are things called Argo floats. And they drift along in the ocean at about 2,000 meters, making measurements. And every 10 days, they come back up to the surface and transmit those measurements back to shore. And in the oceans now, there are over 3,000 of these floats, relaying critical information that help us with improving weather forecasts and understanding the internal structure of the ocean. Another sort of vehicle very recently um, um, coming into operational service are underwater gliders. So these are vehicles with no propulsion system. They just use the structure of the ocean to drive them forward. And very recently, an underwater glider made a voyage all the way from the United States to Bayona in Spain. So an Atlantic crossing, and here is the little glider. It's only about um, two meters long. It is recovered in Spain. And this is a pretty amazing voyage. It emulated the same track as the return of Christopher Columbus after it, finding the Americas. So now in Bayona in Spain, there's a plaque um, commemorating the 2009 voyage of the glider alongside the plaque um, commemorating the return to Bayona of the, uh, the Pinta um, many hundreds of years before. We bring all these observations of the ocean from satellites and inside the ocean together with mathematical models of the ocean to be able to forecast the way in which the ocean is changing. And we can use computer models to understand the circulation of the ocean. What you see here is some false colours showing the temperature of the surface ocean 
and you can see all these wonderful edges as the ocean currents are carrying different types of water around the islands of Hawaii. Okay, time for another question. You all know about global warming um, and that the oceans are warming. How much do you think the oceans have warmed on average over their entire depth over the last hundred years? Any guesses? You've guessed before, you cut the second prize. <laughs> Anyone else? Five degrees. Uh, five degrees, I think, would be worrying a, a great deal. <laughs> Two, two. No? two degrees. No, all much too high. Um, zero point five degrees. Zero point five. No. Zero two. No, we're still much too high. Middle there. One. No. <laughs> that's, that's higher than 0 0.5. <laughs> uh, 0 0.05. You're pretty close, so I'm going to give it to you for that. <laughs> that would be 0 0.03 degrees. Um, doesn't sound a lot. But if you think how big the volume of the oceans is, 0 0.03 degrees on average for the whole ocean is a huge amount of heat stored in the ocean. So now I'm going to quickly just wrap this through some of the opportunities for you um, in different areas of technology. And here's one piece of technology. It's a robotic fish um, with sensors um, in its mouth that has been built to swim around in coastal waters making observations of pollutants. Um, and then transferring them to a docking station so we can understand the coastal pollution. The other end of the spectrum is some big engineering. It's a big production platform being transported offshore. <coughs> and the top size of a big production facility for um, offshore gas being sailed over um, its template. We're going to hear later about lots of things that are happening in offshore renewables and you can see the scale of the engineering in this area. In tidal power generation, there's a tidal power generator in Stranford Lock in Long Island. Lots of challenges in understanding the way the oceans are changing. Um, and particularly where the Arctic Ocean is changing. What you see here is the change in sea ice cover in the Arctic over a period of a decade. Understanding the coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere. Huge challenges, scientific challenges there, and better understanding that in order to be able to improve forecasting. Understanding Resources in the ocean, living resources, so managing fisheries, and protecting the ocean environment. So lots and lots of challenges out there for you. You're the generation that's going to have to address many of these challenges. I'm going to quickly now return to the issue of going to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, because I said only two people have been there before. Well, another two people plan to go there very soon um, in, in the form of one Richard Branson who has just started, just bought this machine um, and aims to go to the bottom of the Mariana's Trench.